Shalom to you, dear brothers and sisters. We are continuing now our, our series of messages that speaks about the heart. We spoke on the first day about the verse that says, guard your heart with all diligence. And we looked at the example of the Pharisee and the tax collector who came to pray at the temple. And then the first day we talked about the Pharisee, that his heart was lying to him. He saw himself in his own self-righteousness. He looked at others from above, looking down at them, and he looked down on them. And he thought that because he fasted, and because he gave tithe, and all those good things he does, and other bad things that he doesn't do, he thought that he was just in his own eyes. And his heart really was deceiving him. This is an example. And then we saw the tax collector who stands in the back and didn't even dare to look his eyes up towards heaven. He felt completely not worthy. And he, and he beat on his own heart. And he confessed his sins. And we saw examples of people like that who know that they are sinners and they feel that they are unworthy and God doesn't want them. And that's also a lie. Both sides are a lie. On the one hand, when you think you're perfect and you deceive yourself, you don't see yourself as God sees him and wasn't ready to receive the correction that God wants to give him. On the other hand, the tax collector who didn't even dare to draw near to God because he felt that he was so bad and he had passed over all the lines and wasn't, was too far. In both those cases, your heart was deceiving them. But God wants people to be saved. That's why God did everything in order to open the way of salvation for them. Today I want to look at another, another deceit that the heart creates. I want to begin in, again in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. Through 10. The heart is more deceitful than all else, and it is desperately wick sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. I give unto each man according to his ways. It's a reminder that our heart is deceitful. And today we're going to speak about a third lie, a third type of lie. And this time we find this example of this lie in Psalm 14. In verse 1, Psalm 14, verse 1, verse 1. It's a Psalm of David. For the choir director of Psalm of David, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. David writes to us in the Holy Spirit about a reality of people who say there is no God. And the Bible defines them as fools. A fool said in his heart, there is no God. Today, there are many people who don't believe that God even exists. They believe that this world just came to be by itself, and they don't need God. And they don't give God any account. They don't even believe He exists. And anyone who just wants to see it, they can see in nature, the wonderful nature around us, all the creation that's full of wisdom, and its legality, and its physics, and the chemistry, and the biology, and all of these subjects, and all the wisdom that there is around it. And to think that all that was came to be by itself, all of the, the complex systems that are there, and how they work, and how it works together, the dolphin sonar, and the bat's ability to fight, navigate, and the navigation systems of birds, and of insects, and the communication system of the bees and of ants, all kinds of many, many, many systems from the smallest and the molecules and atoms and all of those things holding them together until the planets and the galaxies and really the human body and how it's put together and all its wonder, all of these, these are a proof that God exists. And of course, the book of books, the Bible, 3,500 years since Moses' time, full of prophecies that are being fulfilned in front of our eyes. And the winning proof is that the Word of God, that God exists and He rules over history 
And what he wants to happen is what will happen. Because he rules over history. And despite the fact that he has given humans free will to choose between good and evil. And also, of course, Satan, who is active in the field. But we don't want to get into all that right now. But God exists. There are proofs. You just need to see them. And of course, at the moment when you believe in him, that he exists in your heart. And you have that personal relationship with God. But a fool says in his heart, there is no God. I don't believe in God. I don't think God exists. And at the moment when you throw out God, and you say there is no God, then of course, all of your standards that God gives in His Word, from the Ten Commandments and so on, those things then don't obligate you. They melt away. And what was decades ago thought of as contemptible, and now today, they have their pride marches and the heads of the streets because people have lost their moral anchor. So what's the result then? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And they are corrupt. They've committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. Sin, wickedness, all of the kinds of sin and the evil that are spreading over the world today. There's no end to it. No end. It just is becoming worse and worse. And the generation that we live in has thrown away God. And in Psalm 36, verses 1 and 2, I'll read 1 and 2. For the choir director, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, transgression speaks to the ungodly within his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes. So in this psalm, Psalm 36, verses, verse 1, and the title that we read, it's a psalm of David that he's the servant of God. And that's what he says. And now he's given a speech. He's speaking a message of wickedness and about the, the wicked. He speaks about wickedness in the life of the ungodly. And he says, in my heart, that's what I say to my heart. This is what I say to my heart. It's the wickedness. How does it begin? There's no fear of God before his eyes. So the wicked does not fear God. There's no, no fear of God. They have their plans and their programs on TV. The Jews are coming, for example, as a program on TV, where in this program, they make a joke and a mocking about God and about his word. Woe to us. What a lack of a fear of God that people don't understand. They don't understand what they're, who they're dealing with and what they're saying and what they're talking about. And they do this, the judgment that one day they will stand before God. But there's no fear of God in them. And they make a joke, a so joke out of that same God that one day they're going to have to stand before Him, give an account. The same God that decides who's going to be in the heaven or who's going to be in hell. They're going to be lost forever. If they make a joke out of God and His Word. So there's no fear of God in their eyes. Because it flatters Him in His own eyes. So there's no fear of God in front of their eyes of the wicked. But they look all around, but they don't look at God. They don't want to see God. Why don't they want to look at God? Because when we see God in His holiness, something happens to us. The same thing that happened to Isaiah the prophet. When he had a revelation of God with the, seraph, with the seraphs and the angels, crying, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God of hosts. And then he says in verse 5, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. This revelation of God, the moment you see God in His light and His holiness, you see then the sins, the strains of sin in our lives. And that's what happened to Isaiah. The good news, though, for each one of us who hears this message is that God purifies Isaiah. He sends one of those angels to take a coal from the altar and put it on his lips, and he purifies then his lips. And we have example, other examples. For example, in Zechariah the prophet, that when he sees a vision of Joshua the high priest, he was the high priest, and he's wearing dirty clothes. It's in chapter 3 of, of Zechariah. He's wearing dirty, filthy clothes that symbolizes sin. And also there, God 
sends an angel to take off those filthy clothes and to put on him new clothes of righteousness. He says to remove his sin. God doesn't want people to be lost. He doesn't want people to go to hell. In the New Testament, God, it says that God doesn't want the lost to, people to be lost. He wants people to be saved. He wants them to be rescued. God, also in Ezekiel, He doesn't want the wicked to be lost. He wants the wicked to repent. He wants him to repent and return back to God, and God will forgive. God will forgive him and receive the wicked even if he repents. So back to Psalm 36. Um, it flatters him in his own eyes. <clears throat> he doesn't want to take his eyes off on, onto God. He, concerning the discovery of his iniquity, he hates it. So his own wickedness, he sees his own, he doesn't see the, his, ho- his health in God's holiness. He doesn't want God's light to shine into him. He doesn't want that. So he, dis- he prefers to walk in the darkness. But God's message for all who hears this message today, there are people who have said up until today, there's no God. I don't believe in him. That's nonsense. God is speaking to you and to you. And he says, don't stay in that place. You don't need to stay under that definition of a, a fool. I'm ready to receive you. Come back to me. It says in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. So God sent Yeshua to die as a sacrifice, to atone, according to that same principle of those sacrifices that were in the temple. Yeshua offered Himself on the altar of the cross, And he did it in order that people can receive forgiveness and atonement, will be rescued from death, eternal death in hell, and receive the promise of eternal life. Because our soul is eternal, either heaven or hell. So, in order that they would not be lost, those who believe in him, those who believe in his only son, yes, God sent him. I believe in him. And I can, they confess his sins, ask forgiveness of his sins, and put them on you, Yeshua. And I receive the forgiveness. And then he will live, he will get eternal life, and receive the righteousness from God. And now he will be righteous. I'll read verse 17 too. For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. God isn't looking now, in this message that I'm sharing, to make people, to accuse them, You're guilty. You're going to hell. He sent His Son, Yeshua, in order to save them. The one who believes in Him is not judged. But who does not believe in Him has already been judged, because He has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world, that men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, for fear that his deeds will be exposed. So the light of God, people run away from it. They don't want it because they can't continue in their sin then. They can't continue with their their pornography and their money and all the things that they're involved in, all kinds of sins. But he who practices the truth comes to the light, so his deeds may be manifested. So when we receive the faith, then God causes us to be born again, and the Holy Spirit works within our lives. And then we become sons of light, and no longer sons of darkness. And our lives are changed. And then we begin to want to do what's right before God. So with these words, I want to conclude today, conclude this short series. Watch over your God with heart all diligence. Remember that your heart can lie to you and say, there is no God. Don't listen to that lie. If your heart says to you, I'm righteous, I'm perfect, don't listen to that lie. Be humble and open to God and receive His correction. And you can confess and receive His forgiveness. And if your heart says to you, God doesn't want me. I'm not worthy. Don't listen to that lie either. Because God does want you. He wants you. Come. Come to Him. Come back to me, He says. To God. He's a good shepherd. 
Yeshua, he's looking for that one sheep that's lost. And he brings him back to the flock. So I wish all of you a good day. Shalom.